Thomas Kissinger here with you, and I imagine I would refer to this as overwhelming evidence for ultimate restoration through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, many people may think to themselves, well, Thomas, that's all I hear you talk about, or you harp on this a lot. Well, it's because it's the gospel. It's because it is the message. It is the plan of God. And it is so little understood by the body of Christ. Probably 99.9% .9 of Christians do not understand these things. Most blindly go to church, have church, schedule church services and meetings, fly all over the country. And the whole time they're doing all of this, they don't know what the gospel really is. They don't know what the message is, and they don't know the plan of God. They just run around, and in their minds, they're trying to get people out of burning in hell forever. The only problem with that is that's not scriptural. It's not the plan of God. This message of eternal torture or Eternal hell, or you could call it eternal punishment, and also go ahead and throw annihilation into that as well. These doctrines that really portray that God loses the vast majority of the human race, it is embarrassing that there is no scriptural support or evidence for these things, and yet most Christians, this is all they talk about. On the other hand, the ultimate restoration of all things has so much evidence to back it up and support it. It's overwhelming. There's so much evidence to back up and support this ultimate restoration of all things through the Lord Jesus Christ. So if I were to gather the important key things in an organized manner to present to you to tell you what you need to know or what you need to tell others or what you need to go over to perfect the message inside of yourself. Well, here's a snapshot of it. So people need to understand that God created everything. When I say God created everything, he created all things, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him, and for him. And so this means God created good and evil, light and darkness. He created things for us to have to wrestle against. He created Satan. The serpent was the most subtle beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So we need to start there in understanding that God created everything. Number two, we got to know that God is sovereign. God is all-powerful. He is the sovereign of the universe. There is no God outside of him. He does whatsoever he pleases. You can resist his will temporarily, but you cannot resist his plan ultimately. God is sovereign, almighty God. This next category here is a grouping of Hebrew and Greek words that really need to be understood, desperately need to be understood by Christians because they have been mistranslated in many modern leading selling translations and versions of the Bible. They are Olam, Ion, Ionios, Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, and Tartaruo. Olam, Ion, and Ionios deal with the ages or periods of time that have been mistranslated into words like eternal and forever and ever. And when they are used in conjunction with words such as punishment, they portray the false idea of eternal punishment or everlasting punishment when it's not the case. The words Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, and Tartaruo are all different words that have been translated into, into the one English word, hell, that 
really need to be understood in their proper light because when you study Sheol and Hades, you understand it's the grave or the place of the dead. Gehenna was a dump outside of the city of Jerusalem in Jesus' day that Jesus used as a metaphor. And Tartaruo speaks of a confinement or a holding until the day of judgment. But they surely do not speak of an unending torture pit in the middle of the earth where God's going to burn people in literal flames forever and ever. Uh, then we need to understand that the Bible is full of salvation of all scriptures. Full of it. From Genesis to Revelation. People say, well, Thomas, show me some scriptures that say that Jesus is going to save everybody. I tell them, <laughs> Genesis through Revelation. It's full of it. You know, I could, I could produce easily just, you know, on a, ca at a casual glance through the Bible, 100 to 150 of these. Dr. Harold Lovelace, when he was alive, he put a book together and he came up with about 600 of them. The Bible's full of them. You just need to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. You know, like when you hear a scripture, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's talking about everybody's going to be saved in the end. But the Bible is full of these types of scriptures, you know, but people are programmed to explain them away. So another thing we need to understand is the character and nature of God. God is love. And as I've said many times, people say, well, God is love, but... He's also all this other stuff. Well, so what is he? Is he schizophrenic? Does he contradict himself? He's love, but he's also something that's not love. No, God is love. And out of his love flows wrath, vengeance, destruction, judgment, punishment, fire, hell, the lake of fire, and so forth. But these things all flow out of his love and they are for the purpose of correction. We need to understand something about the early church fathers. You don't have to be a scholar on this, but you need to familiarize yourself with the early church fathers. Most all Christians that I've come across are not aware that the majority of the early church fathers all taught and believed in an ultimate restoration of all things through the Lord Jesus Christ for almost the first 500 years. It was not until Augustine came along in the mid-400s who began to argue against the ultimate restoration of all things that the pendulum began to swing over to that false teaching of eternal torture. But Augustine in his day, he had to argue against it because it was already believed and it was an accepted doctrine that ultimately Jesus would save all in the end. He even admitted that most or many of the Christians believed in this and that within the first 500 years, these six schools of learning, that four out of the six taught the ultimate restoration of all things. It was a landslide victory in favor of the ultimate restoration of all things in the early church. They taught it. They believed it. They understood it. They knew the Greek language. And then here comes Augustine who doesn't know how to read and write in Greek. And of course, he gets it wrong. He thinks it's talking about eternal punishment when he doesn't understand the Greek word ion and ionios, which means of the ages or belonging to the ages of time. And there's various configurations of this Greek word that mean the age of the ages, the ages of the ages, the age of the age. These all have to be studied, but they're talking about periods of time. They're not talking about God torturing people forever and ever. We also need to understand something about ownership and liability. And that really refers back to the first point that we brought out that God created everything. When you create, you own what you create and you're liable for what you create. God created everything. So God owns everything and God is liable. It says that God placed all in disobedience that he might have mercy upon all. God is responsible to send the best 
that he has to make restitution because God created everything and God is responsible for what happened. The serpent was the most subtle beast of the field which the Lord God had made. The serpent, the devil, who deceived and ultimately brought about the fall of man. So God was responsible to send the best of his own field, his only begotten son, to make a restitution of all things. And then God even embedded in his law, laws of liability. And he even puts this law, this great, tremendous law in his law called the Jubilee. And it spelled out in the Jubilee that debt was not to go on forever, that every 50 years people were to be released from their debt. Well, look at the spiritual and prophetic implications of this. There's going to be a great jubilee for all of the creation at the end of the age of the ages, a creation's jubilee. Why? How? Because of the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because God created all things through Jesus Christ. And then through Jesus Christ, there's going to be a or an ultimate reconciliation of all things through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1, 16 through 20. We also need to understand that God is all powerful and all loving. God is able to save all and God is willing to save all. And when you get down to the high noon slap and leather part of this argument, those who say that all will not be saved, whether they say they'll be tortured forever or they will be annihilated forever, what they do not understand is they are either limiting the power of God or they are limiting the love of God. You have to limit one or the other if you say that God is not going to bring the whole thing back that Adam brought down. You either have to say God is not able to save all or God is not willing to save all. So you could say, well, God wants to save everybody, but he, he's, he, he can't do it. Well, then he doesn't have the power to do it. Or you could say, well, oh, God has the power to do it, but he has this limited atonement where he only cares about saving some people. Well, then God is not willing. He's not all loving. He doesn't love everyone. You either have to limit the power of God or the love of God if you don't teach the ultimate restoration of all things. The other thing we need to understand is that eternal punishment really is just asinine. It's not a proper collection of terms at all. It's a contradiction, first of all, because the word punishment comes from the Greek word colossus and it means correction. So, I mean, what are you going to do? Eternally correct somebody? No, when you correct someone, it's a means to an end. And when they're corrected, the punishment comes to an end. But then if you really are going to say eternal punishment, the penalty would be so excessive that it would far outweigh the crime. It's just absolutely asinine and ridiculous. It's unscriptural. It goes against the character and nature of God. It goes against the Hebrew and Greek word meanings that have to do with time and the ages. And we got to understand that God is corrective, not vindictive. Most of Christianity sees God as vindictive. They see God as just out to get people, just out to inflict pain, just out to torture or to annihilate or to say, I told you so. No, that's not our Heavenly Father. That may be what's in the heart of man. And he tries to, you know, portray that image onto God. But no, that's not our Heavenly Father. That's not the God who waits for the prodigals to come home and even forgives the self-righteous brother also. And we need to understand something about fire. Fire all through the Bible speaks of God's law. The fiery law is spoken of in Deuteronomy. It is also a metaphor for purification. 
even when it is spelled out in the words lake of fire and brimstone. Fire and brimstone means divine purification. So there you have kind of in a nutshell the main things that we need to know to convince ourselves of the restoration of all things, to perfect the message inside of us, and then to spread this good news, this gospel, this plan and message of God to the world. We have so much information to back up this restoration of all things. It's overwhelming. It's a landslide victory in favor of it. While those who teach eternal torture and annihilation, it's embarrassing how unscriptural those teachings are when you just sit down and look at what the Bible actually has to say about it.